now. So welcome everyone to this very exciting virtual side event we're holding on the virtual sidelines of Climate Week New York, uh, which has hap been happening throughout this week. Uh, we're very excited to bring to you today a topic of uh, huge relevance and huge urgency as we look at uh, events around the world concerning uh, climate action, of course, as well as energy security, uh, energy affordability, uh, and uh, the the general, um, you know, welfare and and uh, state of health of of different communities around the world. This is really at the core of um, of all these topics, which is uh, how can we accelerate renewable energy. So we've convened here uh, an event to talk about kickstarting the next era for energy, which we're terming the renewables era, and especially kickstarting this era as we look ahead to COP27 um, this year, which is being held in, in November in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. Um, and the idea is that we can all come away with uh, a stronger sense of the possibilities and the opportunities to speed up the deployment of renewable energy um, as we focus our, our minds and, and resources on this big climate change conference ahead of us in November. So I'd like to share, first of all, um, who I am, and then I can introduce the agenda for this webinar today. Uh, my name is Joyce Lee. I work as head of policy and projects at the Global Wind Energy Council, which is uh, a nonprofit industry association that represents the full value chain of the wind energy industry around the world. And we're, we're very pleased to be the convening organization uh, for the side event of, of New York Climate Week. Today, we have a very exciting uh, one hour event ahead of us. Um, in just a moment, I'll be introducing the speakers and experts we have with us today. Uh, we will also have a keynote presentation from Dave Jones, who's Global Program Lead at the Think Tank Ember, and he'll be focusing on the outlook, uh, the reasons for optimism, and the reasons for urgency around global renewable electricity and power sector decarbonization. We'll then flow into a panel discussion with our experts uh, with a chance for uh, some questions across the board, as well as for you in the audience to ask some questions. And then we'll close uh, after one hour with some concluding remarks. Um, if at any point you do have questions about Dave's presentation, uh, about the broader energy transition, we very much encourage you to use the Zoom ribbon and click on uh, the Q&A button on your Zoom ribbon panel and just type in your question. We'll, we'll pick it up. Uh, we can all see it as, as part of the panel and then we'll be sure to address it uh, during the moderated panel discussion segment of the event. So before I hand the floor to Dave to provide his uh, keynote presentation, I just wanted to give a moment to um, recognize the incredible experts that we have on the call with us today. Um, so, of course, we have Dave Jones, Global Program Lead at Ember. Uh, we also have Juliana Kainga, who is the Vice Chair of the Electricity Sector Association of Kenya and also works at Enel Green Power, based out of Kenya. We have Alexandra Malone, who is the Director of Corporate Affairs at SSC Renewables. We have Thomas Dalsgaard, who is partner at Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners. And we have John Lezamiz, who is Global Head of Public Affairs at Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy. So a very diverse panel uh, with uh, different regions represented, different parts of the renewable industry, value chain represented, and hopefully that leads to a great discussion today. Um, just a moment to recognize that uh, we are convening this event on the sidelines of New York Climate Week, um, but we're also convening this event on the occasion of the release of our Global Wind Energy Manifesto for COP27. So this is uh, a document that GWEC has um, been, been, uh, been has, has shared with the global wind energy industry to sign up to, which um, signposts eight different action areas where we can see greater climate action, greater action across climate finance, across carbon pricing, across permitting, across availability of grids, and many other areas um, to enact the energy transition. So this manifesto has been released just, just a few hours ago in 13 different languages. 
uh, we very much encourage everyone to to have a look at this um, and and get a sense of what the wind energy industry um, is calling for in the lead up to COP. So with that, I'm going to hand the floor to Dave Jones from Ember to provide his presentation on the global renewables outlook for power sector decarbonization. Dave, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, thanks so much, Joyce, and thanks for the opportunity to present today. So happy to sit here alongside so many experienced renewables experts. For those of you who don't know Ember, we're a global think tank tracking the electricity transition. Uh, we publish monthly electricity generation data as it comes out from system operators and ministries across the world. So if you want the latest monthly electricity data, please do check out our Data Explorer. Um, I want to take you on a little journey of some of that data about where are we now on the global electricity transition. And after that, I'll show you the path about uh, where we might be heading for uh, and why we are already entering an era of renewables. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So uh, here's the global electricity mix. Um, wind and solar already generated over a tenth of global electricity for the first time in 2021. That's more than double of when the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015. In 2021, wind generated almost twice as much electricity as solar. However, solar generation is growing much faster. Wind and solar taken together overtook nuclear power for the first time in 2021. Next slide, please. This graph shows the share of wind and solar by region. You can see at the top that it's Europe that's been leading the transition. Uh, nine out of 10 of the countries with the highest wind and solar penetration are in Europe. But in, uh, in Asia, wind and solar are now really taking off. China and Japan both crossed the 10% marker in 2021 for the first time. In the Americas, most key countries are now over a tenth of their electricity from wind and solar. In Africa and the Middle East in general, it's lacking other regions uh, uh, where Morocco and Jordan are leading the way. And what we found most interesting when we looked at this by countries is how many countries are building out wind and solar so rapidly. In 2021, 50 countries already got over a tenth of their electricity from wind and solar. Next slide. Uh, this is the terawatt hour changes to, to global e electricity. You can see that the red dots are the increase in electricity demand, which is risen on average about 700 terawatt hours per year. And you can see the dark green um, is the increase in, in wind and solar generation, which is getting bigger every year. And we're now getting close to that tipping point where wind and solar are powering all of the world's electricity demand growth. But we're not there yet. And although clean electricity from new nuclear, hydro and bioenergy all adds up, it still isn't enough to meet the rise in the global rise in electricity demand. Therefore, coal and gas power have continued rising and 2021 set another new record for global power sector CO2 emissions. On the latest data we have for 2022, it's hanging in the balance very finely with another all-time record for global power sector CO2 emissions will be set. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. And Obviously, it's a real problem with the power sector emissions still flirting with record highs. Uh, this graphic is from last year's excellent landmark IEA Net Zero report, which sets a realistic pathway for how to keep temperatures to one and a half degrees for the energy sector. It shows the power sector is currently the biggest emitting sector, and it must become the first sector to be net zero by 2040. So that's not just a global coal power phase out by 2040, but there's a near phase out of gas power by 2040 as well. And what's more, the power sector is not uh, only seeing the biggest fall in itself, but it's, it's an enabler for the other sectors. We need clean power to electrify energy use in buildings and transport and industry. So keeping close to one and a half degrees is all about clean power. And at the moment, we're not even close to building enough clean power to keep CO2 emissions from rising. Next slide, please. When we say clean, clean power, clean electricity, we mostly mean wind and solar. According to the IEA, three quarters of the growth in clean electricity will come from wind and solar. So <laughs> I urge you not to get distracted by all the other technologies, but we need them for sure, uh, for sure. Um, but you will always be more important than they are. Wind and solar are truly the superheroes of the transition. 
And uh, on the next slide, uh, uh, it's not just the IEA showing that, uh, it's a really uh, great graphic from the IPCC um, where they list all of the kind of tools in the tools box we have for emissions reductions that can happen this decade. And wind and solar come out top. They're able to cut more emissions this decade than any other technologies. And not only that, but the blue bars um, shows that actually most of the time they don't cost money, they save money. Next slide, please. So how much do we need to build? Well, the IEA shows we need to be building about a terawatt of new wind and solar every year from 2030. Um, a terawatt per year is a nice round number, uh, nice and easy to remember. Uh, it's roughly split 600 gigawatts from solar per year, which is four times as much as was built in 2020. And that's 400 uh, gigawatts of wind per year, again, four times as much as was built in 2020. And of course, the latest short-term projections are nothing like the level of growth that we need, especially for wind. So on the next slide, it's uh, super cool that Global Wind Energy Council in their Global Wind Report earlier this year carried uh, uh, just that message. Um, the headline message, they put, the wind industry enjoyed its second best year ever, but new installations are still quadruple by the end of the decade. And that's a challenge to the wind industry, how to quadruple this decade. On solar, that pathway to quadrupling is unfolding. On, on the demand side, in the black bias is from um, uh, uh, Bloomberg uh, last month. And um, uh, on the demand side, in the black bar, there's already 300 gigawatts of solar forecast to be installed this year, which is more than double what was installed in 2020. And on the supply side, there's so much solar manufacturing capacity coming online, which is uh, very reassuring. Solar's growth is impressive, and barring a catastrophe from China, which is a Worryingly, uh, worrying stranglehold over supply. It looks quite plausible to hit and even exceed that IEA target of uh, just over 600 gigawatts by 2030. If you, uh, you look at some of the clean power commitments coming through this year, they've been absolutely remarkable. There's been some really strong momentum coming through and you've got the US, Germany, UK, Canada, uh, all, by, all, all, all committing to near 100% clean power by 2035. Um, the G7 itself has been talking about that to try to pull Japan in on that as well. And it's extraordinary to think in all these countries in a little over a decade, not only will coal power be phased out, but most of gas power will be as well as renewables takes hold. And that's talking about developed Western countries, but really the lion's share of growth will happen outside of there. If you remember this graphic on the left from earlier, every country needs a 2040 net zero power sector um, if we're looking at one and a half degree pathway. So the number one and number two coal power countries in the world, China and India, yeah, of course, they're building a lot of wind and solar. They'll need to step up further. When you look at the Middle East, North Africa, they generate almost a quarter of the world's gas power with very little renewables currently. Um, perhaps uh, they'll that they, they may well be the, uh, the fastest growing um, sector for renewables or region for renewables of any region. And on the right hand side, it's a reminder that three quarters of electricity demand growth will happen outside of OECD countries. Next decade, electrification will pick up base pace. So huge amounts of clean electricity is needed everywhere to turn the world electric. And if I was to have like one data point that I could show that the renewables era, era is already in full flow, it's this. Um, earlier this month, the IEA analyzed energy employment. And on the left, you can see the calculation of jobs in 2019. You can see that almost every region in the world, clean jobs exceed fossil jobs. And on the right, they made an estimate for 2021. You can see for the first time ever in history in 2021, there were more clean jobs in the world than there were fossil fuel jobs. And one slide to end on, which perhaps is a bit of a funny slide to end on, but uh, I carry on with this theme of wind and solar being superheroes. And we talk about that with power comes responsibility. And as an electricity researcher, I, uh, researcher and as you're all working on, on, uh, on wind and solar, I'd urge you to reach out and get as many cheerleaders as possible. Sure, you need to be lobbying government for stronger targets, more auctions, easier planning regs, all of those. You also need to be shaping the narrative more broadly, get into the world and boast about job creation, investments, cost saving versus burning fossil fuels. Show where you're supporting grid security. And when you see this information, myth bust, myth bust, myth bust. Um, 
looking at how prolific the, the nuclear industry is in talking in its own books is uh, quite stark in comparison to, to quite what you often see coming from the wind and solar industries. Um, it's great to see so many renewables speaking today, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion after this. Um, we're entering a new era of renewables. It won't be a fad, it won't be over a decade. It's a new way we live. And for that, you'll need a lot of friends to get you through the good times and through the bad times. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Dave. Uh, a really fascinating presentation and I, I can share that we, we are recording this presentation, uh, the, the entire webinar, which will be memorialized on GWEX YouTube page and, and also shared later on GWEX LinkedIn page for those of you who are interested in uh, examining the data in a bit more detail. Um, of course, you can find uh, the data and more reports um, on the Renewable Electricity um, Outlook on Ember's website as well. So thank you so much. Um, I, I think this gives us a nice kind of framing, um, a set of framing messages to kick off our discussion uh, with this um, excellent panel of leaders and experts across the wind and renewables industry. So I'd like to invite them onto the, the figurative stage to turn their cameras on. And what I'll do is just stop sharing screen so we can have a bit more of a a lively conversation. Um, and just to, to take some of um, Dave's insights to kick off, I think one terawatt of wind and solar installations uh, per year by 2030 is, is quite a tall hill to climb. Um, there's it's not an easy set of conditions, which uh, we, we have in front of us in this year as well with geopolitical conflicts. Um, energy uh, prices, you know, really wreaking um, havoc in, in, many, in many markets and creating hardships for, for many households and businesses. Um, so there, there's reason for, I think, the, the, this feeling of, can we get there? Can we get to 2030 and quadruple wind and solar in time to meet a net zero compliant pathway? And I'd like to start with that. Um, with that open question, uh, whether we are seeing um, pessimism or signs of optimism from the renewables market, um, signs of good progress, for instance, whether that's in terms of jobs, as Dave had pointed out, or investment uh, trends, technology innovation, um, new geographies that are that are really putting momentum against the transition. And maybe we can start uh, with you, Alexandra. Um, and then we can turn to John and, and please feel free to give a bit more of an introduction to, to who you are and, and what you work on before responding to the question. So Alexandra, I'll start with you. Great, thank you, Joyce. And um, thanks to GWAC for inviting me to speak on today's panel. And thank you, Dave, for that great scene setting presentation. I think really, really great to kick off the discussion. So I'm Alexandra Malone. I'm the Director of Corporate Affairs at SEC Renewables. And just really briefly, for those of you who don't know SEC Renewables, we are part of the SSE Group, which is a UK listed energy company. We are focused on delivering low carbon infrastructure needed to meet net zero. Um, SSE Renewables has got an operational portfolio of four gigawatts. That's across hydropower, onshore wind and offshore wind. And we've got our ambitions to double that capacity by 2026 and by 2031 um, to reach over 13 gigawatts of installed capacity. Uh, our current portfolio is focused on the UK and Ireland, but we've recently entered Europe as well as Asia Pacific, and we're actively looking at opportunities in North America as well. So going back to your question, Joyce, um, although 2022 has been a challenging year for many of the reasons you outlined, I think there has been a lot of positive progress towards scaling up renewables. And I think we can't talk about progress without focusing on technology. I think there's some really good examples of this in action right now. Um, so at SSE Renewables, we're actually currently building the world's largest wind farm at Dogger Bank. Um, that's off the northeast coast of England. It's going to be 3.6 gigawatts when it's complete in 2026. And it's got some pretty stunning technological advances involved in, in getting it completed. It's going to use state-of-the-art 13 megawatt turbines from GE. Um, they're going to be twice the height of the London Eye, for those of you in, on the UK or um, this side of the channel. 
And for our New York audience, um, the turbines are going to be the height of the tower at the Rockefeller Center. So these are pretty, pretty, pretty enormous. And to give you a bit more color on just how powerful the turbines are and how the technology has developed, a single rotation of one of those turbines will produce enough electricity to power a home for two days. So that's just pretty remarkable considering only a few years ago we were installing turbines offshore at half that capacity. I think that just that just gives some you know imagery about how the technology has developed and, and what progress we're making. And um, as an industry, we're also now building offshore wind projects in deeper waters, uh, further from shore, more challenging conditions. And so we can't underestimate the progress that that uh, and the learnings that we're continuing to achieve. And that's not just developers, but also throughout the supply chain, you know, be that building ever larger installation vessels or, you know, perfecting installation techniques. And um, there's a lot of positive learnings that we've got. And just one last one, turning away from technology, just on the policy side, I think another sign of progress is the number of new countries and jurisdictions that we've seen setting ambitious new renewables targets. Dave touched on sort of the macro net zero targets that we've seen um, in the last year or so. And just really government starting to formulate the necessary policy and regulatory regimes to support renewables deployment. Um, I think we'll all agree the you know, landmark passing of the Inflation Reduction Act in the US is real positive for attracting further investment into renewables in the US in particular. So I'll leave it there. Great, thanks so much, Alexandra, and really impressive uh, numbers and, and insights on uh, wind power effectiveness that you shared there. Um, John, let's turn to you for your thoughts on uh, reasons for optimism, signs of progress. Well, thank you very much, uh, Joyce, and, and thank you very much also for giving the opportunity to, to Siemens Camesa to, to take part in the, in the panel. My name is uh, John Lezamiz. I'm Global Head of uh, Public Affairs at Siemens Camesa. For those of you who don't know uh, our company, uh, hopefully very, very minor audience. <laughs> uh, our company is one of the global leaders in, in, the, in the wind sector. We, are, we have more than 40 years of experience. We have installed in the five continents more than 120 gigas of uh, wind power onshore, offshore, currently developing um, power to X, green hydrogen. So I think that, let's say, uh, to, to your question, um, uh, Joyce, the, 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 the coin has two sides, uh, clearly. Extremely positive, as Dave was underlining in his presentation as the introduction. Uh, there is a clear global consensus in fighting the, the, against climate change. Uh, there is clear consensus about the role that renewables have to play. Uh, in the first six months of 2022, for example, the investment in renewables reached a record of 226 billion US dollars, half of it being wind, uh, according to Bloomberg uh, New Identity Finance data. And also, as Dave was saying, this is not about just a PowerPoint presentation and IEA and GWEC estimates telling that we have to quadruple uh, the targets. It, it is true that, for example, we have recently, uh, during this 2022, we have recently uh, read the news about Repower EU program in the EU, so willing to jump uh, to unreach 510 gigas of wind power by 2030. And that implies, for example, quadrupling the installation pace of 2021. In 2021 in Europe, only 11 gigas were installed, while now under the new target, 39 gigas should be installed to achieve those targets. An additional to repower EU in the EU, I think that Alexandra also has mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act and in the US, how that is going to have a positive impact also in boosting renewables investment in the US and how that is going to traction the entire goal together with uh, Europe. That is, that is very positive news. Geographically speaking, uh, we see the EU, US, Japan, South Korea, Brazil, India, Vietnam, Philippines, I mean, all around the world, they are countries are betting for, for wind. We can also explain to you the, the experience, most recent experience that we have had as Siemens Gamesa leaders in Africa, for example, installing a 60 megawatt project in Djibouti. So again, wind is a priority, wind is extremely uh, competitive, it is deployable. However, the other side of the coin, those big targets, we are facing hurdles for those big targets to transform them into real projects into real opportunities. Why? 
And we have included that in the manifesto that we are endorsing. We have endorsed also a Siemens Camesa that has been launched today. A slow permitting. Uh, there has to be um, a redesign of the market because, okay, we have reached competitiveness levels to overcome fossil fuels. We are the winners already, but there has to be a stop in the race to bottom. So this somehow, the need to change the mindset of the energy mix is already there. The targets are already there. The political ambition for those targets to be achieved is already there. But now we have to bring the private sector and the public sector together for those targets to be delivered. The sooner the better and in a competitive way by the industry, because the industry has to remain to deliver. We are the enablers of the transition. And here is where we see that there are some negative um, sites uh, during this, uh, during after the pandemic and the current geopolitical momentum that we are living. And hopefully, hopefully, thanks to the manifesto and some of the statements that we as the private sector have included there, we will be capable of engaging better with the political stakeholders and make COP27 a success. Thank you, Joyce. Great, thanks so much, John. And I, I want to dive a bit deeper into what, what you're calling the other side of the coin here, the implementation barriers to get to the, the required levels of renewables installations by 2030. And, and let's look at an area which has huge excitement around it at the moment, which is offshore wind. Um, excitement from uh, national ambition and interest, uh, looking from countries from Canada to Sri Lanka, um, now raising um, signs of ambition from uh, looking at marine spatial planning and, and possible leasing zones for the future, uh, to even roadmaps for offshore wind, and even investment appetite, where we saw um, numbers from BNEF earlier this year that showed offshore wind investment has grown by 51%. In the first half of this year compared to last year, despite the the, the challenging macroeconomic uh, conditions of the last year. So um, when we look at the other side of the coin, when it comes to offshore wind, I, I want to dive into what are the barriers to, to mobilizing investment, to, to getting projects off the ground, um, especially when we look towards 2030. And maybe, um, Thomas, we can start with you if if you're able um, to, to hear us. Okay, good. We can we can see you now. Um, Thomas, uh, tell us a little bit about um, the, the barriers to investment and build out of offshore wind and, and feel free to provide a bit of an introduction as well um, to who you are and your work. Yes, hello. Uh, <clears throat> good, good, good morning. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joyce, and and uh, I'm I'm sorry about the the bad connection I'm having here uh, at home. Uh, let me first say that um, that uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Just a few words about uh, CIP. We are one of the largest uh, investors in green energy projects in the world. Uh, we have invested uh, 20 billion euros to date uh, over the past 10 years, and we are aiming for 100 billion euros uh, towards uh, 2030. So we're really really big uh, investor in, in, in green energy. Uh, we have a global investor base and we also have projects globally, uh, global presence within wind, solar and other renewables. But as you say, um, it is very much offshore wind that we are also um, looking into where we are sort of uh, from our heritage uh, here in Denmark. We uh, we are certainly also very much into uh, to offshore wind. And let me just echo uh, what Joan said that uh, you know, we have the political ambition, uh, we have the technologies, which is now also competitive at market terms and, and, and scalable. Um, and let me add another dimension. We also have the private capital. Uh, I represent a fund manager. We have uh, around 140 investors into our funds, which are investing into green uh, energy. Uh, just as, as an example, we are just about to start raising our new fund five which in itself is going to be 15 billion euros, a humongous amount. And, uh, and, and we have good line of sights of the project there. So sort of all these very important uh, things are in place. Uh, what is then the, the concern? Um, uh, what is lacking? And I, I must say, I, I, 
I think, uh, given that we actually have the the, the political tailwinds, and 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 mind you, uh, also just to Dave's uh, presentation, this is not just about uh, decarbonization. It's also about energy independence, energy security, uh, not least in Europe. So that's a huge political tailwind for this. But what we experience in the daily life in the machine room is that the procedures, uh, the, 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 the permitting, the tender models, the way we interact with, with, with the government and the uh, sort of administration, there it, need, it, it gets tricky because I think for, for the whole uh, you know, government system and administrative system, we need to scale things at a much, much uh, bigger level than we have been used to. And, and this is where uh, it's things getting, uh, getting slowed down, so to speak, P probably understandably, because of course, there's also some risk aversion to sort of, when you have to do things in new ways, it's, uh, it's not always easy to sit in government and, and to allow for that uh, and, and to sort of uh, be very proactive. But we need, really need the, what I call the three Ps, pace, predictability, and permitting. Uh, and, and so, so this, is, this is very, very um, important. And I think at the bottom of all this is that we need to have a mutual understanding between governments and, and private sector that we need to unleash. The, of course, the private sector needs to act responsibly. We need to act within certain frameworks that is set by governments. But it is us who need to be in the driver's seat, whereas the government should focus more on setting the broader frameworks rather than very sort of, um, you know, very detailed uh, tendering systems or, or what have you. That, I think, could sort of open up for a much bigger deployment. And it is also, of course, a little bit of a concern that we see all these goals being 2030 goals. Um, and, and, and with this uh, delay in, in a lot of permitting procedures and tenders, there's, you know, right now is actually a good moment to invest because uh, we can see that the huge bottlenecks are building up towards 2030. So that's why there's no reason to wait. It's just to get you know, get the projects going now so we can actually also be prepared for what is coming in 2030. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Thomas. I, I think the point is, is made clearly. We, we have um, uh, challenges around inflation hitting different regions of the world this year, and, and what we don't want to see is continued target inflation around climate action uh, and the requirements by 2030 without the requisite policy and regulatory reforms on the ground. Um, I, Juliana and Dave, I want to come back to you in this conversation, but just um, to pick up on a question we've had from the audience and perhaps Alexandra, you'd be well placed on this topic of offshore wind. Someone has asked, um, what are the most critical risks to investors nowadays when it comes to offshore wind in the US? Yeah, I think in the US, it's not dissimilar to the risks you know, elsewhere in the world, but I think if you're looking at investing in offshore in the US, um, things like certainty of route to market and revenue streams. There's a you know patchwork of state and federal level and um, so routes to market. So there's OREC, you know state level OREC. There's tax credits. that need to piece that all together and have good visibility. And obviously the Inflation Reduction Act has has given investors some of that certainty. But there was definitely a period um, of uncertainty, specifically around around the tax credit side. Um, I would also just echo what Thomas is saying about the permitting side of things. Um, that you know that creates a risk for for developers when you're going in. You know there can be uncertainty around how long it will take to permit a project. Um, in the U.S., I, it's you know a lot of the the offshore projects there are very much first of their kind, um, and so we don't know how long you know the process the process will take. Um, different stakeholders involved, quite a complex stakeholder landscape, um, both onshore and in the marine space. So those are probably the the risks that we're considering um, when looking at the U.S. Thanks so much, Alexandra, and please keep those questions coming. We will pick them up as this discussion progresses. So I want to come back to uh, something that Dave shared in the presentation, which is the huge growth of electricity demand coming from non-OECD markets um, and, and start to look at how this conversation is playing out when it comes to global South countries. So we've talked about energy supply tightness. We've talked about cost challenges. Um, how, how are these factors um, impacting the growth of renewables when it comes to 
um, trying to, to balance now between energy security, the affordability of electricity, and uh, hitting renewables targets uh, to, to mitigate climate change. How is this playing out in the global south? Um, I, I would like to begin with Juliana, and, and again, feel free to introduce yourself before responding, and then we can move to Dave. So Juliana, let's, let's start with you. Thanks, Joyce, and uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Juliana Kainga. I am the Vice Chairperson of the Electricity Sector Association of Kenya, which is a business member organization and a think tank that was founded in 2019. Uh, now mandate is to basically ensure the sustainable development of the electricity space in Kenya. We cover private sector players across generation, transmission, distribution, and commercial and industrial spaces within the market. And we have around at least 90% of the IPP market within the, the organization that's represented. So I also work for NL Green Power as a part of the business development team covering East and West Africa, and I'm based out of Nairobi, Kenya. So to, to, to answer the question, I think I, I really like what, what Dave mentioned earlier. Um, and and I'll, also, I'll also mention this because I think it's important. And uh, there's a lot of talk about a sort of a go, go, go attitude when it comes to the, the growth of renewables. But in certain areas, we really need to stop and take a second look of how we can actually deploy uh, this very, very important um, part of the ecosystem. So the issue you mentioned of the challenges of climate change and the energy crisis for a region like the global north has, has become of a concern in 2022 because of obviously global economic events and geopolitical issues. So for the global south, the problem of energy supply and affordability and solving for these complex issues has always been a perennial problem. So this is, this is nothing new, but it does require customizing our solutions at different levels of the systems that we operate in. So as we look at what we can do with renewables, each country, we have to look at the resources and capabilities. So the current situation is presenting a huge challenge for developing nations who are ideally, most are net importers and the rise in uh, fuel, the cost of fuel, the ongoing supply chain issues obviously is, is, is increasing the cost of living and also these countries are facing a high inflation rate. So as a result of this, the need is to reevaluate the economic activities that are dependent on traditional fuel sources um, and, make, and, and basically this makes the renewable energy argument a bit more compelling. So just to give you an example, in Kenya, for instance, the fuel subsidies in the transport sector cost the country around 1.5 billion USD in 2022. And I know the conversation today isn't on greening the transport sector, but I use this example to show the opportunity presently and emphasize that the conversation on renewable energy needs to be on economic growth uh, whenever we speak of it. So in addition to that, renewable energy's potential impact on the livelihoods of the population beyond uh, electricity in your home, it really affects the entire value chain and the ecosystem of the country. So if you're talking about a country like Kenya, my home country, the grid is already at 90% renewable energy. So what does that mean if you're talking about a Google attitude about renewable energy? Um, we need to show that essentially renewable energy can solve for other issues that the country is facing. And this is what I mean by customizing solutions for different places that we want to actually deploy sustainable uh, energy solutions, be it wind or solar. So, and, and basically that's the issue, right? That competing traditional fuels are seen to solve for energy security. But when it comes to affordability, renewable energy definitely takes the lead, uh, but it's not the only part of the pros list. So in terms of how these challenges we're talking about are impacting the growth of renewables, it's all about timing and seizing the moment that we have right now. So there are four main issues that most developing nations are facing. The first is high cost of living. The second is a debt crisis. Third is climate uh, adaptation, and uh, fourth is, uh, is unemployment. So in the conversations that we have in the next few weeks at COP about renewable energy, don't tackle these four issues, then we'll have a really, really hard time 
to sort of negate what's happening when you're talking about uh, gas being a transitional fuel and being used for that. But not everything is sort of at, at a stalemate. We're seeing countries like South Africa um, solving for their energy security problems by launching obviously multiple renewable energy tender rounds, also reevaluating their policy when it comes to distributed energy and, and raising that threshold. So just in a nutshell, the conversation for the global South is very different. We are not at the same economic levels as South Africa. So how can renewable energy help us get there? Great, thanks so much, Julian. I, I, I really like this response because it's not about reinventing the wheel when it comes to re renewable energy. And it puts the onus, I think, back on the practitioners, on, on the providers of renewable energy to widen the conversation and recognize uh, you know, what, what are the material benefits that we can really bring to different country contexts and how can we how can we speak about this um, using uh, the, the, the terms and the language and, and the opportunities that will translate well um, to, to different communities um, rather than um, the, the typical language that we might speak about when it comes to targets and emissions mitigation. Um, so, so great, great points. And, and let's come back to this issue around uh, the, the kind of political compromise to be made at COP, of course. Dave, um, over to you for your views. Yeah, I'll start by um, kind of saying how Europe reacted within the crisis and then kind of bring that back to a global, um, a, a global side. And um, the way that Europe reacted to the crisis when it kicked off was really to um, its first instinct was to double down on renewable general electricity. Um, Europe knows it has that long-term problem and it needs to uh, permanently cut reliance on Russian gas. So when the RE Power, um, uh, RE Power EU package went through, so it packaged through to 2030, and it was uh, trying to really step up uh, renewable uh, the, the uh, renewables within the electricity mix. So it wasn't just phasing out coal like before, but it's also building enough clean power to start really eating substantially into gas generation this decade as well, which is a big change for Europe. In other countries, and especially in the global south, which is <laughs> more distant from that, from, from Russia's war in Ukraine, um, it wasn't as immediately obvious the prices would remain high for so long. So because it takes time to build renewables, renewables wasn't the thing on people's minds to, to solve the problem for this winter or for this summer. Um, but now it's over 12 months since when Putin first started selling the taps down to Europe and we're uh, starting that, and that rise in global fuel prices kind of started from, from that moment. And 12 months later, you've got international gas prices trading at multiples of what they were before the crisis. This week, you've got coal prices uh, setting new highs. So it's clear that high fossil fuel prices aren't going to go away and countries are now realizing that, that now they're thinking that they need to plan uh, more for the long term. So there's been a, a little bit of a delay really about that realization about embracing renewables um, and what renewables can, can, can do for countries. And already before the crisis, wind and solar were competitive with electricity from fossil fuels in many parts of the world. But now that difference is really stark and economics will win eventually. Uh, and also, it's been mentioned before by, by Thomas, but the wind and solar bring that, that element of security of supply with them as well. They're generating electricity in, the own, in their own country. There's no need for expensive fuel imports. And when, the, even when renewables are cheap and secure, the government's still a kind of gatekeeper to action. They need to set up auctions and CFDs. They need to fast track planning. Uh, they need to plan for flexibility in the power grid to be able to integrate that much renewables into the power grid. And the, the biggest risk, I guess, that's happened from the, the energy crisis and the talk around fossil fuel is just the distraction around um, uh, all the other things around affordability and, uh, and fossil investment that's distracting from the government massively scaling up on electricity. Both um, uh, Thomas and Alexandra talked about like what the governments are doing and what they need to do through their processes to scale up. And when you look at it from, a, you know, we're, we're talking about the US having problems, but when you're talking about it as a, you know, as a, as smaller countries and what needs to happen administratively in terms of that focus to get all those right um, uh, ducks in a line, I, I, I'd call it, that requires immense focus on that. So it's not the countries don't want that, it's just that it's taking them time to set that up. And I, I think that, um, the whole of the energy crisis is a little bit distracting for them and what really needs to 
kind of come through and will definitely come through in the long term, but needs to come through sooner rather than later is, is really for governments to have that focus on how do you how do you get that wind and solar pipeline up and going as quickly as possible and how do you eliminate some of the barriers to it it's always a shame that the government is such a gatekeeper to action within that but that's the kind of uh, the nature of, uh, of the world that we're in thanks so much dave i i i think the the key question around this year's cop is is how um, implementation and action and there have been some good uh, insights into how to speed up, how to provide greater confidence to the market, um, to mobilize private sector finance in particular, um, shared on this call. And let's let's go back to the topic for the webinar, which is COP27, and um, pick up on the, the complexity around this year's COP when it comes to, as, you, as you've mentioned, um, energy security, uh, concerns. Uh, we're seeing, you know, worsening uh, climatic, uh, worsening weather patterns linked to climate change. Uh, we're seeing major economies in the last year that have suffered blackouts um, due to grid management issues and, and other issues. Of course, the, the invasion of Ukraine has had huge knock-on effects, um, not just in Europe, but in sustained fossil fuel um, price volatility uh, that, that affects uh, markets worldwide. And um, this delicate balance of interests now that uh, countries, especially countries um, in the global south, who also face, as Juliana mentioned, um, issues around debt and cost of living, uh, et cetera, need to, need to strike when it comes to coming to COP with a substantive commitment. How, how is the panel feeling when it comes to the expectations around uh, the political outcome for COP27 this year? I'd like to start with um, Thomas, and then perhaps we can go to John and then Juliana. So Thomas, over to you. So um, my expectations are sky high. Um, no, I was at the, I was at COP26 in, uh, in Glasgow, and, uh, and, the, and the key word there was action now. Uh, did that happen? I, I guess it's a bit unclear, uh, really. Uh, so I think the the keywords for this year's COP is is, is to, for me going to be the same. I mean, we don't need really to set new political um, big uh, targets or anything. We need we need the action and the execution, and and we have discussed this uh, at, at length here. Um, and I think, I, I mean, of course, the circumstances have changed quite dramatically since last year in, in Glasgow, since we have the war. And, uh, and, and it's now evidence that we need to really, really speed up, not, not just because of the climate, which has also, by the way, shown its teeth uh, this year, the climate crisis, but also, of course, the energy independence. So in, in reality, it should not be, uh, you know, it should not be that complicated to agree that we now need to really step up. Uh, but again, I, I, I am uh, sorry. I need to uh, I need to uh, repeat myself that the transmission from the political ambition and down to the machine room is just really, really difficult, and it takes a lot of time. And I think it's really if the governments could come together and sort of somehow uh, have a much uh, oath that they now really want to uh, to to also think a little bit in new ways. There was a lot of mention. There was a lot of mentioning about uh, government-run tenders, and that has been the model in many markets. For instance, in offshore winds, we believe that the time has come also to look at other models where you can have more, sort of much more consistent-based models. For instance, freeing up more of the seabed in the in the various uh, spatial uh, maritime plans uh, to allow private sector participants to go in there. Not not it should not be competitive. But you don't need to tender it out in very detailed conditions every time. You can also let the private sector sort of do the final details and let the government says the overall frameworks. One thing we should be very mindful about at COP27 is, of course, what we should avoid is, of course, that we log in uh, fossil structures and especially that we sort of agree on new fossil investments and we have sort of allow for that because that is a big danger in the world as we see it because it is very tempting right now for many governments to actually you know uh, use this not an, as an excuse because i don't think they sort of want to but it's, it's just to be mindful that if we do new fossil investment today it's going to be there for the next 30 40 maybe 50 years 
obviously we need to use some of our fossil fuels longer than we had anticipated due to the energy energy independence and security of supply but but the cop uh, should really be careful to send a strong signal that that the green transformation will continue will be speeded up thanks so much thomas very very clear response uh john over to you for your thoughts Thank you. Thank you very much, Joyce. I think that under the current uh, geopolitical challenges that we are facing, COP27 represents just a unique opportunity uh, to governments and, and parties attending uh, to show to the entire world the capacity uh, and the willingness that they have uh, uh, to align on, on essential matters. These being not only climate change, but as Thomas was saying, energy security. I think that this new ingredient is of vital essence. And this is the reason why uh, we consider, for example, at COP26 in, in Glasgow, uh, what it was reached that facing, facing down uh, unabated coal usage and facing out inefficient uh, fossil fuel subsidies, I think that it could be uh, quite aspirational uh, to face out all of them, not only inefficient, but efficient because there are no efficient fossil fuel subsidies. So face out the fossil fuel subsidies while also facing out completely the use of coal. If I may also, based on the manifesto, just willing to tackle very briefly the, the key eight takeaways of the manifesto. I mean, what we need and we would expect from, uh, from a COP27 outcome would be to provide market visibility, scale up the ambition and higher volumes for green power, transform, as said before, transform targets into real opportunities, urgently streamlining permitting, develop ancillary infrastructure like grids, evolve to energy markets for the future. Price cannot be the only driver to achieve energy security. There are many other elements rather than price. Avoid, as uh, Thomas was saying, avoid long-term locking of fossil fuel uh, generation. Uh, develop a just transition that is crucial as well. Ensure national and regional finance are linked to climate goals. This has been also stated by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres and uh, US Climate Envoy John Kirby during this week as well. So we have to align financing with climate goals. And last but not least, progress into the implementation of the global rule book, rule book for carbon, carbon uh, markets. So that could be my, my quiz list for this COP27. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Uh, Juliana, over to you. Yeah, I think uh, some really good points that, that have been put out there. So I, I do agree with John, because uh, I, I, I do think that uh, as much as we have people sitting on either side of the table, opposing sides of the table, there are certain uh, pertinent discussions that need to be had that would benefit, uh, that would generally benefit energy and electrification. So things like grid uh, management issues and digitalization, especially we're talking about this on the continent, which it hasn't happened yet. So it means we're able to integrate renewable energy. Those discussions happen around private investment actually going into transmission and distribution and changing the models of distribution systems on the continent. I think those are really, really good discussions to have, and it really doesn't matter which side of the table that you're sitting on. The other thing is on the supply chain issue, that's actually affect, affecting the affordability of renewable energy. So how do we come up with um, a, a simplified, uh, more sustainable way of actually uh, ensuring that renewable energy doesn't face this crisis at the end of, 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 of the supply chain issues that we're seeing? So I think as much as it seems like it's going to be a tough discussion across the board, I think there are some conversations that are very, very critical, regardless of, of where you are. So yeah. Great, I think, I think that's quite fair to point out. Thanks, Juliana. Um, I know we're running close to the hour, but I, I did want to hopefully uh, answer another question from the audience. I mean, given this is a New York Climate Week event, it's no surprise we're getting a lot of US-focused questions. Um, and maybe Alexandra, since you, you answered the first question around offshore wind um, in the US, someone has asked around the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, which is a key focus of, of this week's conversations um, in New York on offshore wind investment. And maybe you can broaden the aperture a little bit to, to talk about other examples of um, you know, key policy actions around the world that have will have a, a positive impact on renewables investment. 
Sure. So Inflation Reduction Act, despite its name, is actually a very comprehensive renewable energy law um, that will have a really positive impact on the sector overall. In terms of offshore, specifically, there's a couple things um, that the IRA is um, helping to unlock. One is around domestic supply chain. So domestic supply chain ambitions are really important for the success of an offshore wind sector within the U.S. And um, the Act provides some tax credits um, that will support offshore wind manufacturing domestically, which will really help to um, sort of kickstart the domestic um, offshore wind supply chain in the U.S. Um, secondly, we talked a lot about planning and streamlining. There's some provisions in, in the bill around more efficient planning, um, things like giving more funding to the bodies like BOEM and NOAA. Um, who are running a lot of those, um, those processes. And then lastly, just from a practical perspective, it actually allows um, for offshore wind development in more areas in the US. So for example, it lifts the previous ban on offshore wind development um, in the Southern Atlantic and the Eastern Gulf of Mexico um, and allows for development of offshore wind off US territory. So it just gives some more, some more seabed uh, for offshore wind to develop. And then just briefly elsewhere, I can give an example from, from the UK. Um, there's a British energy security strategy that was released earlier this year in response to the war in Ukraine, and that outlines some steps to accelerate offshore wind consenting, which we talked about before. We've seen in other countries just setting that importance of setting targets for offshore wind um, and also putting in place the tender processes and giving visibility to, to the industry to say, okay, for the next 10 years, there'll be an auction you know, every year, every 18 months which helps developers and again, helps supply chain have that visibility. Fantastic examples. Thanks so much, Alexandra. Um, I, I want to come back to the panel for a last round of lightning questions. And the <laughs> lightning uh, means it'll be a very short question and hopefully we can get a round of um, quick responses, 30 seconds or so um, on the key topic of COP27. So John shared his wish list. Uh, which is really the, the global wind industry's wish list for COP27, eight quite comprehensive areas for action. Um, I would like each panelist to limit themselves to one action uh, that they would like to see at this year's COP um, in order to accelerate our progress on global power sector decarbonization. So I'm going to go around um, to each panelist and uh, hopefully we can get really interesting roundup of responses here. Dave, let's let's start with you. It's a big one. Um, it's uh, another one we talked about so far is uh, around the G7, but if you look at the G20, uh, the G20, unlike the G7, haven't stepped up to commit to one and a half degrees. Um, and what we need from there is more, more uh, stronger messaging from countries outside the G7 um, that they can that they can do that. Um, what's holding back the global electricity transition at the moment is really um, uh, other countries outside the G7 really stepping up on that. And you can only have that ambition to step up if you have a real underlying commitment to, to go deep on climate action and keep to one and a half degrees. Excellent point. Worth noting out the G20 Leader Summit is happening during the second week of COP in Bali. So hopefully that's something we do see in their uh, leader statement. Um, John, over to you. I think my, my, my statement could be to push renewables-based electrification as much as possible. We have the solution, so we don't have to wait. It is already on the table. That could be my takeaway. Thanks, John. Excellent. Uh, Juliana, over to you. Yeah, I think one thing for me is to put the committed dollars to work. There was around uh, a little over $30 billion that was committed to developing countries from an international financing perspective and also to climate adaptation. But we, I would like to see a progress a bit of uh, where those dollars have gone. I would like to see a bit more collaboration because a lot of work has been put in by uh, governments on the continent on what the roadmap looks like for them. Nigeria has done that. Kenya has just released a proposal of what the next 20 years would look like. And this will, this will be supported by 100 gigawatts of renewable energy. So I would like to see, okay, so where is this money? Uh, going to go are there more commitments that we can make how are we going to deploy this so just putting those dollars to actual work good point thank you juliana uh thomas over to you 
I think uh, we. Sh I think it'll be great if we can sort of unleash uh, that private sector even more, including the private capital from pension funds and uh, and other big institutional investors. There is a lot of appetite for investing into this. There is also appetite on taking risk. The governments, uh, if they could sort of agree to uh, letting go a little bit uh, and 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 allowing these dynamics to evolve from the market side and also from the private financing side, I think we can get a lot of win wins and also early on uh, by allowing that and having focus on that at, at COP twenty seven. Thanks, Thomas and Alexandra. Last response from you. Yeah, always hard to go last, but I think uh, it'd be great to see more a commitment to more collaboration between countries. I think we've seen a lot of countries where renewables have been rolled out really successfully at grid scale. So learning lessons and sharing those lessons um, of what's been successful, but also you know maybe pitfalls uh, would be really great to see that enhanced collaboration between countries. Fantastic. Well, I think that brings us to the, the final moments of our webinar and, and something that gives me cause for hope is every single key action area that has been highlighted just now is, is not entirely time sensitive to COP. I mean, although we don't, we have a huge sense of urgency in front of us. I think these are all actions that we can continue to work towards. We should be working towards um, beyond COP27 as well. And um, just to sum up the conversation, I mean, I, I think it's clear that there's a, a, a wider lens that we all need to take when it comes to um, expectations and opportunities for renewable energy to grow and, and really hit the, the wind and solar one terawatt installation target by 2030 that um, net zero roadmaps are calling for. Um, we need to take a more holistic approach, which has sensitivity towards you know, the, the imbalance of climate finance and the effectiveness of climate finance. How can we mobilize private sector investment and, and the private market in particular? Um, sensitivity to current hardships around energy security and independence, um, tightness of supply, um, national debt burdens as well, and, and issues around inflation. But I think underscoring all of these um, conditions or, or challenges is really a, a strength of the the industry's track record in delivering. Uh, as as John said, we we have these the tools and we have the technology. Uh, we we have already the means to to transform communities for good and and start to resolve these challenges. It's really just trying to translate this. But we hope to be growing ambition into, into action implementation. Um, and we have some really good examples today of what that should look like around areas like consenting and policy packages that open up um, land and seabed for, for more projects. So with that, um, I'm going to bring the webinar to a close. A big thank you to all of our panelists uh, for joining us today. It's been extremely insightful to have your your expertise, your perspective, perspectives, uh, you know, building and, and supporting renewable energy on the ground um, with, with us today. And uh, thank you as well to all of our audience members who've been able to join us. Um, enjoy the rest of Climate Week New York, and we hope to see you at COP27.